Hello, this lecture is going to be covering chapter 39, Incident Management. Um, we're going to be covering uh, three main topics in this chapter. Uh, we're going to be uh, reviewing the uh, FEMA uh, National Incident Management System, NIMS, um, the ICS uh, system, and that you have uh, already covered in depth with your NIMS uh, certifications, your NIMS uh, 100 and 700, that was the prerequisite for the course. We're just going to review those. Um, we're going to cover triage, uh, triaging of, of mass casualty incidents, and then we're going to cover um, hazmat, so your response and incident management of, of hazmat incidences. Now, none of these things that we're going to cover today, we're covering uh, uh, in depth. Uh, you know, some certain courses, fire course, um, other courses that you're going to take throughout your career are going to cover these things a little more in depth. Um, however, we just want you to, um, you know, bring yourself up to the uh, what, we, what we would call the awareness level of, of these uh, concepts. Um, disasters and mass casualty incidences um, can be overwhelming. Um, generally, um, those are, are um, defined as three or more patients. However, um, a better definition for a mass casualty incident would be um, a, uh, an incident that has more victims than you have resources. So you, you, it, your resources have been exhausted by the number of patients there, uh, and you now need additional help, and that's what makes something a mass casualty incident. Um, so not always necessarily three or more patients. I mean, there's certainly been times where, uh, you know, I've been on auto accidents with, with four or five victims, and I wouldn't classify those as mass casualty inc incidents, especially working, you know, in the city uh, where we've got multiple uh, resources. We were, you know, easily able to handle that um, type of a run. Um, the incident command system uh, makes it possible to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So we're going to talk about the incident command system and how that's uh, briefly, we're going to talk about how that's set up and some different key terms that you want to be uh, aware of. The National Incident Management System, or NIMS, uh, promotes efficient coordination of emergency incidents at the regional, uh, state, and national levels. So, again, this was developed by FEMA. Um, this was developed out of uh, wildfires in California. There was a, a mismatch of, um, of resources, of uh, terminology, um, and, and, and procedures um, based, you know, through different organizations. So different fire departments were doing things certain ways. Other fire departments were doing things different ways. Um, you know, FEMA, when FEMA was established, they realized we need, we need some sort of um, national uh, standard uh, to, that, that all agencies can follow. So if you work for the Columbus Fire Department, you can, um, you know, as an EMT, and you respond with uh, other agencies at a mass casualty incident, we're all going to be using generally the same terms. Um, so again, the, the NIMS uh, system was implemented in 2004, and, and, and it provides a framework. So again, it doesn't tell you how to do everything. It just provides that framework for you to um, put the, the pieces together, right? So you're going to uh, build off of that framework. Um, it, it enables federal, state, and local governments um, to, uh, as I mentioned before, to work together, um, as well as private sector um, uh, private sector and um, non-governmental um, uh, organizations. The organizational structure must be flexible enough um, to be um, rapidly adaptable. Um, so we must be able to flex that organizational structure in the event um, that it needs flexed. Um, it provides standard standardization in terminology, resource classification, personal training, and certification. So if someone is... Um, you know, again, certified in this, this, in the past, this was already um, essentially the same, but if somebody is certified as an EMT in the state of Ohio, we can, you know, uh, reasonably assume that an EMT in, in the state of, of California is going to be um, an equal, you know, an equal certification, an equal responder. Um, terminology is standardized throughout, so we're all using the same terms um, and resource classification. So some major NIMS um, components, um, preparedness, communications and information management, resource management, um, command and management. That's a big one. Command and management is, is uh, uh, the command structure that NIMS sets up. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and ongoing management and uh, maintenance. So the incident command system, um, sometimes referred to as the incident management system, but um, I would say 
it's vastly referred to as the ICS, or Incident Command System. The purpose is to ensure uh, responder and public safety, um, to achieve incident management goals, and ensure the efficient use of resources. So just to give you kind of a brief um, a description of what the ICS, Incident Command System, is, it's basically, like I mentioned before, uh, or like the slideshow mentioned before, it's a framework. Um, and this um, has, you know, a, a multitude of different forms and, and resources that we can use to properly um, achieve our goals of, of, the, of whatever incident it is. So, for example, um, you know, right now we're dealing with the, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, a lot of fire departments are using the incident management system, um, the incident command system, to uh, achieve the goals of, of what, what we want to achieve, you know, per, uh, you know, personnel safety, public health, those types of things. They're using a lot of these incident command system uh, resources. Um, this controls the duplication of effort and freelancing. Um, freelancing is when someone goes out and does uh, whatever they want to, you know, they may be working towards that common goal, um, but they're doing it without the knowledge of their, the command structure. Freelancing is dangerous because there's a lack of accountability um, and there's a, a lack of a coordinated effort. The command system limits the span of control. So it's what span of control is, is um, if, if you put me in charge of uh, 10 different people, uh, I'm not going to be able to control 10 different people. I'm not going to be able to understand what 10 different people are, are, are doing. Um, the, the number that they usually look for is like five to six. Um, so you can be responsible for five to six other, other people. That's what span of control uh, means. Organizational levels um, include sections, branches, divisions, and, and groups. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. All right, so here's um, an example of, of uh, some of the different branches um, of the command system, operations, planning, logistics, finance. You'll see underneath those branches are divisions or groups. So again, this is a way to use span of control um, in order to achieve our goals. So if you're working under the operations branch, um, you know you may be assigned to uh, a certain division or group. So um, you may be working under the EMS operations uh, branch, and you may be the triage group. Um, so you can see there how that kind of flows out. You're under operations, you're the EMS branch, and you're working for the triage group. Um, that's kind of how that, that how that process flows. And those are, again, repeatable amongst all these different um, branches and sections, operations, planning, logistics, finance. Um, so command, uh, the incident commander is in charge of the overall incident. Um, that's one of those common terms that I was talking about before. If you say incident commander, you're talking about the person who's in charge of the entire incident. It's important to know who that is and how to communicate with them. Where the command post is located. So if you do arrive on the scene of a mass casualty incident, it's important that you know who that incident commander is and where they're located at. doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to go communicate with them immediately, but if you need to, you need to know where they're at. An incident commander may transfer command to someone with more experience in a critical area. Um, every incident uh, must have an incident commander. That may be very informal. So if you are a single medic and you're responding to a, a, you know, an EMS run, and you're by yourself with with your you and your partner are by yourselves, um, and you are the the you know most senior EMT, and you're in charge of that run. You're the incident commander, and it sounds kind of silly because um, there's there's no more resources than that, and that's true. Um, but someone has to be in charge of every incident that we respond to. So the incident commander role in the ICS is the only role that's filled on every single incident, because even the very smallest incidents must have an incident commander. Now on that small EMS run or auto accident, um, you're not going to set up an operations uh, section and a planning section and logistics and finance. You're not going to set all those things up. That's why this is scalable. Um, but you will have an instant commander. Um, so that's an important function um, that someone must take. And you as, a, as an EMT, you may be the first arriving, um, you know, first responder on the scene uh, of a large incident. Um, we look at, uh, you know, in the past, uh, the Las Vegas shooting, the, the you know, movie theater shooting in Aurora, Colorado. Um, there's a lot of these different uh, uh, mass casualty type incidents where, you know, there was an EMT that, that arrived first and they may be the only one there for the first few minutes. Um, and it takes a good, uh, uh, strong command presence for you to set up 
the pieces in those first few minutes, those first few critical minutes. And a lot of that is just notifying, you know, that what you've got. Um, but it, it does take, uh, it is important um, to take those steps as an instant commander, even as just a, you know, an, an EMT that's arriving first on the scene. Um, so in the finance section, they're responsible for documenting all expenditures uh, at, an, at an incident for reimbursement. Um, logistics is responsible for communications equipment, facilities, food and water, fuel, lighting, and medical uh, equipment and supplies. And I'm not going to go too in-depth with those. Operations, as an EMT, you'd generally be assigned to the operations uh, section. Very large or complex incident, they're responsible for managing the tactical operations, usually handled by the incident commander. Um, so tactical operations may be uh, you know, EMTs going in to extract, you know, injured, injured persons. Um, command staff, the safety officer, um, so part of these are um, three uh, members of the command staff. So, so they work side by side with the incident commander. Um, first is the safety officer. They monitor the scene for conditions um, or operations that may present a hazard. The, the PIO or the public information officer, they provide media with clear and understandable information um, that's coming from the incident commander. And then the liaison officer relays information um, and concerns among command, the general staff, and other agencies. So they kind of work as the, the go-between person. Um, that's what the liaison officer does. Communications and information management. Communications uh, has historically been a weak point at, at most major incidents. It's recommended that communications be integrated. So if you are working um, you know, for a private ambulance company who happens to take scene runs with a uh, with a local fire department, to be able to communicate with that fire department effectively is really important. Around here, that doesn't happen all that much. Around here in, in, in Ohio in general, uh, most uh, 911 emergency EMS is, is taken care of by the, the fire department, fire-based EMS. Um, the only, you know, one major exception to that in our local area is Delaware County EMS. So Delaware County EMS is, is uh, you know, has the ability to um, speak with Delaware City Fire Department and all of the, the you know, the local townships around the county. Uh, mobilization and deployment. Uh, when you arrive on a scene, you're going to check in with the incident commander. That's, that's uh, again, scalable. If it's a very, very large incident, you may not directly check in with the incident commander. You may be checking in with the incident commander's staff, um, but you're going to report to your supervisor for initial briefing so that Incident commander is going to assign you to a supervisor, and they're going to say, "All right, you're, um, you know, you're on medic one today. Uh, you're going to be. Um, you arrive on the scene as medic one. You go up, you tell them you're there, uh, and they may be uh, assigning you to the triage group. Um, so they're going to say you're going to report to, you know, lieutenant so and so, and they're in charge of the triage group. Um, so that's basically how that would work as far as mobilization goes." Uh, record keeping allows for tracking a time spent on the actual incident for reimbursement purposes. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, accountability means you are keeping your supervisor advised of your location, actions, and completed tasks. So if you're tasked with something, you're tasked with um, you know entering a structure to find a victim and then remove that victim, treat that victim, whatever the case may be, um, accountability means you are keeping your supervisor advised of, of what you're doing. EMS response within the ICS um, uh, preparedness um, involves the decisions made and basic planning done before an incident occurs. So keeping the proper amount of equipment, having um, you know different uh, different resources available to us, it's all important. It involves decisions and planning about most na most likely natural disasters for the area. So you know something like uh, a hurricane, we're not concerned with in the state of Ohio. Uh, tornadoes, on the other hand, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna make decisions. We're gonna plan about. Uh, potential for, for something like that. Your EMS agency should have uh, written disaster plans that you regularly are trained to carry out. Scene size up, make an initial assessment and some pre pre preliminary decisions. Um, drive by uh, three basic questions. What do I have? What do I need? And what do I need to do? Um, so those are all important questions to ask. Um, ask yourself uh, when you arrive on the scene. You arrive on the scene um, and and you want to ask those those three basic questions. Establishing command, um, as I mentioned before, command should should be established early and and by the most senior official who's on the scene. Again, that may be you. You know, you could be a brand new EMT um, who's riding on an ambulance uh, with another brand new EMT, and you may be the most senior official on the scene. You have to take command. You have to establish that command. 
Um, notification to other responders uh, should go out. So you notify everyone um, who's responding that you are in command. Um, and then you request those necessary resources. And again, that may be, it's typical, you know, for an instant commander um, in the first few minutes, that's all they're really concerned with is what do I have and what do I need? How much, how many resources do I need? So that may be the case where you arrive on the scene first and you realize, okay, I've got a, you know, an active shooter that, and we've got a report of, you know, 20 victims down in a, in a building. Uh, you need to start calling for additional resources. Um, communications, if, if possible, use face-to-face -face communications that limits radio traffic. We've got a large incident with, you know, hundreds of first responders on the scene. If we all talked on the radio and no one would be able to, uh, you know, get out and say anything. Um, so if you, if you can use face-to-face -face communications um, with your supervisor, with the incident commander, you know, if that's possible. You communicate via radio. Um, we do not use 10 codes or signals. Um, police still use 10 codes. Um, however, in, in the fire service, we've adopted uh, most areas anyways, um, have adopted the uh, using what we call plain language. So plain language means say what you mean. Um, we don't need to use 10 codes. Uh, equipment must be reliable, durable, and field tested. That's, again, not, not really a concern of you. Um, and then as far as backups being in place, again, The medical branch of incident command, so as an EMT, generally, uh, if, if you arrive at the scene of any major incident, um, you're probably going to be assigned to the medical branch. Uh, medical incident command is also known as the medical branch of the ICF. Their primary roles are triage treatment and transport of injured people. So triage treatment and transport, that's, that's what we're going to be focusing on here. All right, so here's a little flow chart to show you the EMS branch. Um, and then triage, treatment, and transport. And if you want to go ahead and pause the video now and review these uh, elements of triage, treatment, and transport, that would probably be a good idea. Just kind of take a look at those things, and you can uh, um, take note of, of some of the different tasks for each of those different um, sections. All right, so a triage supervisor. A triage supervisor is in charge of counting and prioritizing patients. They ensure that uh, every patient receives initial assessment of his or her condition. Um, do not begin treatment until all patients are triaged. Um, and that's a little flexible on that. That's, uh, you know, that's kind of a broad statement there. I would say we would have to be a little flexible with it because it kind of depends on how many patients we're expecting. If you're expecting a lot of patients, you may actually start treating patients before all are triaged. You may not be able to access all the patients at this time. In that case, you're going to start treating uh, so the treatment supervisor locates and sets up a treatment area within uh, with a tier for each priority of patients. So this is where, if it's a very large incident, a lot of casualties, we're going to be setting up somewhat of a field hospital, and that's the responsibility of the treatment supervisor. Um, they ensure a secondary triage is performed. So once a patient comes into their field hospital, they triage them again to determine, okay, is this person stable? Are they, uh, you know, an immediate patient? Uh, are they unstable? Do we need to do we need to treat them right away, or or have they perished? Are they deceased, and we no longer need to, to worry about treating them? Um, that's going to be a responsibility of the treatment supervisor. <clears throat> transportation supervisor coordinates the transportation and distribution of patients to the appropriate receiving hospitals, documents and tracks the number of of transport vehicles trans patients transported in the facility destination. Um, so that's kind of the last step in the EMS, uh, excuse me, medical branch. So the triage, so the, the flow of this is, is essentially the triage group is going to go out. They're going to um, find the patients, bring the patients towards the, the treatment area. And as they're doing that, they're going to be triaging them. So they're going to be determining who needs treated first, who's already perished, who is, is um, you know, minor and doesn't necessarily need treatment at this point. Um, then the treatment uh, uh, group is going to work on treating those patients, you know, in the field right there before they get transported. And then as the availability of transport vehicles um, arrives, um, the transport supervisor then will uh, coordinate transporting those patients to different hospitals. A lot of times with this, uh, the tra transportation supervisor calls the local hospitals and determines how many patients each hospital can take in the, in the local area. They may be sending patients out, you know, to all sorts of different hospitals around the state, uh, depending on the, the size of the incident. Um, staging supervisor, typically not um, a, an EMS role. 
um, but it's a, it's quite possible if it's a very large EMS incident that we would have an EMS staging supervisor. Um, they would be assigned uh, when scenes require multi-vehicle, multi-agency response, where you've got a lot of medic vehicles coming in. Again, we don't want uh, freelancing. We don't want this mass chaos of, uh, of medics showing up and just parking wherever they want, driving right up to the scene, going out and doing things without somebody knowing what's going on. So we have a staging supervisor that sets up an area um, away from the incident where all of these vehicles, all of these crews assemble. They, they park there first, and then they get assigned by the incident commander to certain locations so that everyone knows where they're at uh, and they can keep some sort of control over that. Um, physicians on scene, um, physicians can, can help us. We want to use their help, especially in large incidents. There's a physician there that's willing to help. Uh, the best place for them is in the treatment um, area, the treatment and, and potentially the triage area. They can make some difficult triage decisions. So they can be the ones to say, you know what, this person's not savable. Let's move on to the next person. You know, that's a good decision for that physician to make. They can provide secondary triage decisions in that treatment area. And then they can provide on-scene medical direction for EMTs. So they can uh, advise EMTs, you know, hey, this is what I want you guys to do. Um, for these patients to provide that on-scene medical direction. A rehab supervisor establishes an area that provides protection from the ele elements and situation. So uh, in, in any large incident, we like to set up a rehab area, and that's rehab for responders, for first responders. Uh, rehabilitation is where a responder's needs for rest, fluids, food, protection from the elements are met. Extrication or special rescue, again, not necessarily part of, of EMS, um, but they determine the type of equipment and resources needed for the situation. So if there's some sort of collapse or building collapse or fire or something that's endangering victims or it's difficult for us to access them and it's some sort of mass casualty, uh, extrication or special rescue group are going to be the ones um, uh, to, to take care of that. Uh, morgue supervisor, again, very large incident, uh, something where there's a lot of, of uh, a, a high number of deaths. Um, there's a possibility that the, uh, the morgue uh, would come and they would work in conjunction with the medical branch. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about what a, a uh, mass casualty incident is. Again, uh, the, the book in the slides here def defining it as, as three or more patients. Again, I prefer the definition of uh, more patients than our resources can handle. Uh, mass casualty incidents uh, place a great demand on the EMS system and has the potential to produce multiple casualties. All systems have different protocols when to declare a mass casualty incident and initiate the ICS. So it depends on the, the department that you work for. It depends on the agency that you work for as far as when you're going to declare a mass casualty incident. Again, Columbus Fire Department, you know, there's we can handle we can handle quite a few patients before we need uh, uh, extra resources to come in and help us versus a smaller fire department, uh, you know, smaller township fire department or somewhere that's isolated, that's out in the middle of nowhere where, where they don't have many resources, something large happens there, you know, a tour bus flips over with, with 40 patients, that's going to be a mass casualty incident very quickly for them. Um, you uh, and your team cannot treat and transport all injured patients at the same time. So remember that. You, you need to call for more resources. Never leave the scene with the patients um, if there are still other patients who are sick or wounded. Um, and that's, that's just meaning um, if you're the only resource there, uh, you shouldn't just grab the first patient that you find and take them to the hospital. Because that first patient that you find may not be the, the first patient that needs to go to the hospital. There are multiple patients and not enough resource um, to handle them without abandoning victims. You should declare a mass casualty incident, request those additional resources, and then you're going to initiate that instant command uh, system. Triage. Let's talk about what triage means. Triage means to sort. Um, it's meaning to sort patients based on the severity of their injuries. The assessment is brief and the patient condition categories are basic. We're looking at ABCs when it comes to triage. We're not doing a full, we're not doing a sample history. We're not conducting an OPQRST. We're not doing a head to toe assessment, uh, you know, a secondary assessment, I should say. We're looking at them very quickly to determine if their ABCs are intact and if there's any major bleeding. Those are the only things we're really looking for when we, when we perform a triage. 
Primary triage is done in the field. Secondary triage is done as the patients are brought to the treatment area. All right, so there's four categories um, of triage, and the, those categories give us the order of treatment and transport. So the four categories, and they're typically, uh, they, we typically use colors to designate them, um, are red, yellow, green, and black, and that is immediate, delayed, minor, or minimal, and then expectant, which, which is de uh, dead or likely to die. Um, so those four categories in a mass casualty incident, we want to place every person in, every victim, I should say, in one of those four categories. And that's going to determine uh, the order of, treat of treatment and the order of transport. So again, immediate victims we're going to de designate as red. Those are victims that have issues with the ABCs, but they're still savable. So they still are breathing. They still have a pulse, but maybe their pul pulse is weak. Their breathing is very compromised. That's an immediate patient. A delayed patient or a yellow patient is a patient who <clears throat> may have um, an injury uh, that needs that it's uh, debilitating to them, that needs a uh, fix. You know, they cannot take care of themselves because of that, but they have, um, you know, their ABCs are all intact. Minor or minimal is an injury that that person can, can you know, continue to be mobile with. So we call these folks uh, the walking wounded, meaning they can, they can carry on with their day. This might be a broken arm or, or a, a broken finger or, or something like that, or even something like a gunshot wound to the arm that, that is no longer bleeding. That's, that's a, a green patient. That's a minor, um, you know, we'll get to them eventually, but they're not a priority. And then, and then the, the, uh, uh, the, the expectants or the black, uh, colored, um, uh, patients are, uh, those who are um, already dead or they're likely to die, meaning they're not breathing. They don't have a pulse or, you know, their, their pulse is so weak and they're not breathing that, that you just uh, are going to make the call in the field that this person's not savable. The idea behind triage is that we save the people that we can save and we don't waste our time trying to save those that we can't. All right, so if you would like, you can pause this um, video here and go over this triage table here, triage priorities. There's some good information here that gives you some different um, ideas about what you're looking at for um, red tags, yellow tags, green tags, or the black tags. Tagging patients early assists in tracking them and can help uh, keep an accurate record of the conditions. Tag, tag should be weatherproof, easily read, and color coded. Uh, when we meet in class, I will uh, be I'll be able to show you um, examples of triage tags, and we'll practice with those so that you can see what a, a triage tag actually looks like. Um, start triage. Uh, start stands for simple triage and rapid uh, treatment. This is uh, the first step of this of the start triage is uh, to call out to patients and direct them to an easily identifiable landmark. So those folks who can walk, we tell them to go walk somewhere. So if someone, if if you come upon a very large crowd, there's been some sort of mass casualty incident that's happened. First thing that you want to do is get on the PA of your of your ambulance. You want to get on the loudspeaker, and you want to say, "If um, please proceed to, uh, you know, Main and and Fourth Street. Uh, please please proceed to Main and Fourth Street for treatment. That's going to get all of those walking wounded's out of the way. So anybody who can walk, that will get them out of the way. That's a that's a really key step there." You can walk. We want you to get out of the way because you're not a priority patient if you can still walk. Um, the second step then is uh, directed toward non-walking patients. So this, these are the folks who now are still staying where they're at, even though we told everyone to go, you know, to a to a uh, identifiable landmark. These folks are staying where they're at, and that means that they're probably yellow tags or red tags or black tags. Um, so then we're going to go in and we're going to triage those folks. We're going to assess their respiratory rate, their hemodynamic status, meaning are they hypovolemically stable? Are, do they have a good, strong pulse, or is it weak? And their neurologic status, are they alert and oriented? Or are they confused and, and, and dizzy, and, and they're showing signs of, of potential shock? Some special, consider, some, uh, excuse me, some special triage considerations. 
patients who are hysterical and disruptive to rescue efforts may need to be handled as an immediate priority. So even though that patient may not have any physical injuries, if they're being hysterical and they're getting in the way, we may have to assign a crew to that person and get them out of, out of the way. A responder who becomes sick or injured during the rescue effort should be handled as an immediate priority. So again, responders, we have to consider ourselves to be the priority because if we're not there to help, um, who is? So we're going to consider them to be an immediate priority. Identify uh, patients as contaminated or decontaminated in hazmat incidences, and we'll talk about hazmat incidences here in a little bit. Destination decisions. All patients triaged as immediate uh, or delayed, so red or yellow tags, should be transported by ground or air ambulance. Um, in large situations, a bus may transport the green tags. So there is a, a possibility for us to, to call in, um, you know, call in a CODA bus, call in a, a city bus. Um, to help transport a large number of green tag patients. Um, immediate priority patients should be transported two at a time um, until all are transported from the site. So there's going to be two patients per medic, even on the priority uh, immediate patients. Um, the, after all of that happens, the patients in the delayed category can be transported two or three at a time. Um, finally, the slightly injured are transported, uh, and that's again by using those uh, the buses. If, if possible. Uh, patients who are expectant, so um, those um, who we considered to, to, you know, to potentially be dead or, or, or near death, if they're still alive, uh, by the time we've treat, transported and treated everybody else, uh, or we can go back to them then and, and, and you know, double check um, and, and uh, assist in, in resuscitating them if, if we've treated everybody else. Uh, and then de uh, dead victims are handled or transported according to the SOP for the area. Uh, for the most part, that uh, that means we leave them in place. Most SOPs are going to tell you if, if we've tagged them in black, uh, we're going to leave them in place. We're not going to move them. All right, so switching gears here a little bit, disaster management. A disaster is a widespread event. This is what we're talking about. Uh, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes. Uh, those are natural disasters. Uh Terrorist type events can be a, a disaster as well. Um, some disasters may not involve personal injuries, but many disasters result in widespread injuries. So there's possibility that you've got a disaster and you may be staffing a disaster scene that has very few in injuries. Um, you know, something like a, a flood uh, where you don't have any, any uh, personal injuries uh, for that particular disaster. Your role is to respond when requested, report to the IC for assigned Casualty collection area may be established in a disaster with an overwhelming number of, of casualties. Um, so casualty collection area is, is where um, if we've got a lot of rescue crews that are going out over a widespread area trying to find patients, so something like a flood, a, a hurricane, a tornado, they may go out and, and just grab all the patients they can and bring them back to a casualty collection area. All right, so uh, switching gears again towards um, hazardous materials. Um, again, as I mentioned in the beginning of the of the uh, slideshow, um, we're not certainly not going through a, a, a full hazmat course here, certainly not turning you into hazmat techs or even the operations level or even the awareness level for that matter. We just want you to be a, a bit more aware after this course of hazardous materials. So the idea here behind these slides are um, that that you'll be aware of hazardous materials so that in the event you're responding, you're the first to arrive on the scene of a hazardous material incident, you're aware enough to understand that, that safety is important and you need to, to back away and call for the proper resources. Um, rushing into unsafe scenes can be catastrophic. Um, again, if you're overcome, you'll be able to, uh, unable to assist with patients. So you're not helping anything, you're hurting, you're, you're making the problem worse. According to OSHA, first responders at the awareness level should have sufficient training or experience to demonstrate the following competencies. An understanding of what hazardous substances are and the risks associated with them. An understanding of the potential outcomes of an incident. Again, we're not training you to the awareness level. Uh, most of you will be trained to the awareness level, either if you work um, you know, for a private ambulance, the possibility they would do that. Certainly, if you work for a fire department, if you've gone through fire school, um, you're already uh, um, at least hazardous materials um, uh, awareness level trained. Um, areas of training or experience. 
Um, the, the ability to uh, recognize the presence of hazardous substances, the ability to identify the hazardous substance if possible, an understanding of the role of the first responder, awareness individual, and the ability to determine the need for additional resources and notify the communication center. So again, your, the important thing for you to do is recognize and then notify. As far as recognizing a hazardous material, um, these, these materials pose an unreasonable risk of damage or injury. if It's not properly controlled during handling, storage, manufacture, processing, so on and so forth. Take time to look at the whole scene. This is not a scene that you want to rush in on. Uh, so someone uh, very wise in hazardous materials once told me, if you hold out, your, hold out your thumb in front of your face, you can't cover up the entire incident with your thumb. When you first arrive, you're too close. Um, so you need to make sure to stay back and slowly proceed to take in all this information as you're, as you're uh, arriving on scene. Hazardous materials may be involved in uh, any of the following situations. Um, truck or train crashes, substance leaking from a tank truck uh, or a tank car, a leak, fire, or other emergency at an industrial plant, refineries, complexes, a leak or rupture of an underground natural gas pipe, Fuel tanks, deteriorating fuel tanks, um, buildup of methane or, or other byproducts of waste decomposition in sewers, or motor, motor vehicle crash uh, resulting in a ruptured gas tank. All those are, are potential hazardous material runs. Uh, as far as occupation, and, or, excuse me, occupancy and location, a wide variety of chemicals are stored in a wide range of locations. One of the ones that people don't think about a lot are pool rooms. You go to the local YMCA for a, you know, a patient who's having... Uh, difficulty breathing and, and they're a, let's say they're a lifeguard and they just happen to, to go through the, the, the storage closet near the, the pool. Um, you know, pool rooms have a lot of, of strong chemicals, um, strong uh, bleaches and, and other types of chemicals. So something to think about there. Senses, the senses uh, that can be safely used are those of sight and sound. So you don't ever want to rely on uh, smelling something or certainly tasting something to determine whether or not it's a hazardous material. Uh, because if you if you get that close and, and it's very easy for you to become overcome by that hazardous material. Um, so as far as defining containers, containers any vessel or receptacle that holds material. Often the container type, size, or material construction can, can provide important clues about the nature of the substance inside. Um, so identifying quickly the container will tell you a lot about it. So if you see a truck that's overturned and it's leaking a fluid and it looks like a, you know, a fuel truck, well, that gives you a decent idea that there's a possibility that's a flammable liquid. Um, so it's just you know, understanding and, and, and identifying the type of container is, is important. Container volume is important. Certainly, the larger the volume, the more uh, potential for uh, you know, a higher level of, of uh, hazardous materials. some pictures of different containers that you may encounter. Smaller containers, non-bulk storage vessels, hold commonly used com uh, commercial and industrial chemicals. <clears throat> it can be drums, bags, uh, carboys, or, or cylinders. Again, that's talking about, you know, uh, something like a pool room or something like that. You know, smaller factories, smaller uh, manufacturing plants that just have smaller uh, amount of chemicals. Still very dangerous, but, but less uh, quantity. Uh, Department of Transportation marking system. Labels, placards, and other markings uh, are used on buildings, packages, boxes, and containers. Um, the marking systems indicate the presence of a hazardous material from a safe distance and provide clues about the substance. Placards are diamond-shaped. I'll show you pictures of the placards. I'm sure you all have seen them. Um, labels are smaller version of the placards, so there's so there's possibility that labels are placed on individual packages, and then the placards should be visible on the outside of the of the, the vehicle or the container. So there's a uh, uh, an image there of those uh, placards that you may that you may encounter. Uh, feel free to pause the video here and take a look at this um, hazardous materials warning labels um, chart. It just gives you kind of an idea of some of the different um, some of the different possibilities that you have out there. Uh, you know, you see up in the upper left hand corner there, um, all of those orange uh, placards, all those orange triangular placards. Those are 
are generally uh, listing explosives. Um, you know, the red placards, generally uh, some sort of a flammable gas, flammable liquid, those types of things. Um, so you can, uh, you know, look through that chart there. Um, the Department of Transportation System does not require that all chemical shipments be marked. In most cases, the package or cargo tank must contain a certain amount of hazardous materials before a placard is required. So what's telling you there is just because it doesn't have a placard doesn't mean it's not hazardous materials. This may mean that the, the amount of hazardous materials fell below the amount uh, that that company had to, you know, was required by law to place a placard on the outside. Um, some chemicals are so hazardous that shipping any amount requires the use of labels or placards. All right, this, you may um, have seen this before. Certainly, if you've been through fire class, um, you've seen this. This is an emergency response guidebook. Um, this is produced by the U.S. Department of Transportation. This is a very common document that you're going to find most uh, ambulances, most fire trucks are going to have a, an ERG. We typically call it the ERG. They're going to have an ERG on the vehicle somewhere. And this is a quick reference guide for you if you come upon a vehicle that is leaking some sort of fluid or gas and you notice a placard, you can open up this book and identify what that, uh, potentially what that hazard is. This is also available in app form. If you search through your app store ERG, uh, ERG uh, book or ERG, um, this, you'll be able to pull this up, download the app that has this for your phone. Uh, I believe there's the latest one out. It's 2016. I'm guessing there'll probably be a 2019 or 2020 that comes out here soon. They're updated every three to four years. Uh, but it provides information on approximately 4,000 different chemicals. It provides not only information about the chemicals, but it provides information about uh, how far away you should stay from the chemicals, whether or not there's explosive hazards, evacuation distances, all that. It's good information. Another point of reference that you may uh, find necessary is a material safety data sheet. Any sort of chemical that's used in uh, a business or manufacturing, um, uh, warehouses, manufacturing plants, those kind of things. Um, if there's a chemical that's used, it, it's required by law that they have a, a material safety data sheet or an MSDS um, for that chemical. So again, if you uh, are in a, a factory warehouse or something and there's some sort of chemical or gas, you can uh, request to see their MSDS sheets to get some more information about uh, what may be leaking out and how hazardous it is to you. The other reference that you can look for is shipping papers. Um, so if the... Uh, if a hazardous material is being shipped via train or, or truck, um, they should have shipping papers that, that identify the materials. Despite the availability of resources, identification may still be difficult. Um, presence of the following may help visible cloud or strange looking smoke from the escaping substance, a leak or spill from a tank, um, or an unusual strong uh, or noxious odor in the area. So if you see any of those things, visible cloud of smoke or, or, or uh, substance, leaks uh, from a truck or a container uh, or an unusual odor, uh, just treat it as a hazardous material until it's proven otherwise. Uh, if any sign suggests that a hazmat incident has occurred, stop at a safe distance, park upwind and uphill from that incident, call for a hazmat team, try to assess the situation. You know, try to, uh, try to see if you can see any placards, you know, from a safe distance away. Most vehicles carry a set of binoculars with them so that you can look at a distance and see if there's any sort of uh, placards. Do not re-enter the scene. Do not leave the area until you've been cleared. And avoid all contact with the material itself. As far as um, operations on a hazmat scene, uh, use the, don't hesitate to use the ambulance's public address system. Use the PA. Alert everyone around them. Everyone, you know, tell everyone to get away. Everyone come towards, you know, come towards my voice. Uh, try to get people out by using the PA system um, versus actually having to exit your vehicle and put yourself in harm's way. Establish control zones. Securing access helps to ensure that no one will accidentally enter the, the decontaminant or excuse me, the contaminated area. See different three different control zones here: hot zone, warm zone, and cold zone. The hot zone is where that hazardous material is actually at. So if it's a vapor cloud, it's wherever that vapor cloud's at. If it's a uh, explosion hazard, it's wherever the explosion hazard is at. That's the hot. The warm zone is the decontamination corridor, and this is where you will be decontaminated. If hazmat arrives on the scene and you've entered the hot zone, before you leave the hot zone, you're going to go through a decontamination corridor, and that's in the that's what we call the warm zone. 
The cold zone is where everything else is going to be, and that's the safe zone. That's where the incident commander is going to be, the, where the command post is going to be. That's where your treatment area is going to be set up, your transport area. That's all going to be set up in the cold zone. Um, your role on a hazmat scene um, would would fall under the same classification as the, the ICS and the NIMS. It's triage, treatment, and transport, and then setting up rehab. Your role is going to be the same as as on a, a mass casualty type incident. Personal protective equipment. Um, just talk through some different levels here. Um, PPE levels to indicate the amount and type of protective gear that you need to prevent injury from a substance. Level A is for the most hazardous uh, uh, substances. I'll show you some pictures here in a minute of the different levels. Uh, again. Not super important that you know this, just understand that there's there's definitely different levels of protective equipment. So if you happen to read in the ERG or a material safety data sheet that that, that substance requires a level A hazmat suit, um, that means that's a hazardous chemical. It's a very hazardous chemical. So that's full encapsulation, chemical resistant, as well as their own um, SCBA, you know, self-contained breathing apparatus. Level, level B is non-encapsulating protective clothing um, or clothing that's designed to protect against a particular hazard. Also requires uh, their own air supply, such as an SCBA. Um, level C requires use of non-permeable clothing and eye protection, face masks that filter um, all inhaled outside air. So a little less protection there with level C. And then level D is the least amount of protection, and that's um, uh, just a work uniform like coveralls um, and affords minimal protection. All levels require the use of gloves. So there you go. You can see uh, from left to right there, A, B, C, and D, uh, the different uh, levels of, of uh, protection, A being the most and then D being the, the least. As far as uh, caring for patients, it's practical only to provide the simplest assessment and essential care in the hazard zone and the decontamination area because of the danger time constraints, and bulky protective gear. So what they're telling you here is provide the simplest amount of uh, assessment and care in the hazard zone. So if you're in the hazard zone, the only things you want to do are protect that person's ABCs, right? It's the essential care. Get them to the decontamination area so that they can be decontaminated, and after they're decontaminated is when we can you know, provide more care, more comprehensive care. Your care of patients must address the following two issues. Any trauma that's resulted from other related mechanisms such as vehicle collision, fire, explosion, and the injury and harm that may have resulted from exposure to the toxic hazardous substance. So keep in mind that um, they may be overcome with uh, fumes of ammonia from, an, from a, a tanker truck um, that they rear-ended. So not only are they going to have the ammonia issues, the difficulty breathing because of, of inhaling ammonia, they're also going to have potentially the trauma that resulted from motor vehicle collision. Most serious injuries and deaths from hazardous materials result from airway and breathing problems. That's, you know, nine times out of ten, it's an airway issue. Um, in some cases, the hazmat team may find patients who need immediate treatment before the decontamination area has been set up. In that case, the hazmat team is going to be responsible for treating them. You are, to, you are not to, uh, you know, to make contact with somebody who's, who's contaminated um, to treat them uh, at, under any circumstance unless you're properly trained and you have the proper protective, uh, personal protective equipment. And again, there's some different protective equipment that you may be required to wear. And again, you're only going to be doing this if you're trained um, by your agency uh, uh, you know, to, to don this equipment and, and care for those patients. All right, so let's go through some review questions. Um, number one, what is the purpose of the incident command system, the ICS? Uh, ensuring responders and public, uh, excuse me, ensuring responder and public safety, achieving incident management goals, and ensuring the efficient use of resources, or D, all of the above. The answer for this one is D, all of the above. All three of those items there are um, the part of the purpose of the incident command system. Number two, upon arrival at a scene in which the incident command system has been activated, you should expect to do what? And you can go ahead and pause the video now and uh, review those uh, options. The answer for number two is A. Uh, you should, ex upon arriving at the scene, 
which the incident command system has been activated, you should expect to be passed from sector to sector as needed in between assignments. So the incident commander establishes those sectors of responsibility and officers for those sections. So you go to the triage group, okay, that's one of the sectors that you may be assigned to. Um, the incident commander is going to tell you to report to the triage group. You certainly don't want to um, report to the incident commander between every assignment. Once you're assigned to a sector or a group, they're, they're going to maintain control of you until, um, until no longer needed. Um, C is incorrect. Uh, be assigned to a specific responsibility for the duration. That may be true, but that may also not be true. Um, chances are you're not going to be assigned to the same responsibility for the entire incident. And then D is incorrect. Um, uh, because we don't function independently on these incidents. We work as a team. We work um, in coordination with everyone else. Number three, when EMS responds to a, a disaster as part of their response within the ICS, EMS would start with a scene size up. What is the next step for the first responding units? Communicating with additional units, establishing command, caring for any injuries, or stabilizing the incident. So you've responded to a disaster. You start with that scene size up. That's the very first thing you're going to do is size up the scene. What's the next thing you do? The next thing you do is establish command. As I mentioned before, every incident must have command established. So after you perform a good scene size up and you answer those basic questions, what do I have? What do I need? Um, you're going to establish command. Or which of the following statements best describes a mass casualty incident? At least half of the patients are dead. Either a bus or an airplane has crashed. You have more than two critical patients. Or the patient count exhausts your resources. And the answer for number four is D, the patient count exhausts your resources. Remember I mentioned, you know, the book and the slideshow kind of talks about three victims. Um, however, I like this definition. I, I know they kind of go back and forth there, but this definition I think is the best, and that is that you've got more demand um, than you have supply. Right? You've got more demand for services than you can uh, than you can maintain. That's a mass casualty incident. All right, number five. Which of the following patients would have the highest treatment priority at the scene of a mass casualty incident? Highest treatment priority at the scene of a mass casualty incident. You can pause the video there and read through those. And the answer to number five is A, 24-year-old man who is unconscious, has snoring respirations, and severe burns. So the biggest reason why um, uh, B, C, and D are all incorrect is because B, C, and D, we're going to consider them all dead. 32-year-old woman who's pulsosynapnic, mass casualty incident, that person's dead. We're not saving them. We're moving on to somebody that we can save. Same thing with C, 29-year-old woman, full cardiac arrest, massive open chest trauma. Move on. She's a black tag. Same thing with D, 32-year-old man with an open head injury, exposed brain matter. No carotid pulse. We're not saving that guy. We're not even going to try. We're going to use our resources to try to save somebody that we can. All right, number six, how does a disaster differ from a mass casualty incident? Um, is it? Uh, you can go ahead and pause the video there, read through those. And the answer here is D, all of the above. Disasters may not involve personal injuries. In a disaster, EMS may be on the scene for days or weeks, and only an elected official can declare a disaster. So remember, you can uh, declare a mass casualty incident, uh, but elected officials are the ones who declare uh, disaster areas. Number seven, a large tanker truck is overturned on a highway. When you arrive, you see a clear liquid leaking from the rear of the tanker. The driver, who appears to be unconscious, is still in the vehicle and is bleeding heavily from the face. What's so the following should you do? You can pause the video there and read through those. And the answer for number seven is B, fully assess the situation and request the appropriate assistance. For this one, do not has uh, excuse me. Do not uh, um, uh, cave into the pressure of of going and, and rescuing that patient. As an 
EMT, you're not going to have the proper equipment to go in and rescue that patient if that is truly a hazmat scene. So you've got to take a step back and you got to realize what's going on. Now, if you assess the situation and you determine that the liquid leaking from the rear of the tanker happens to be milk because this was a milk truck, you're going to change your decision and you're going to go in and rescue the, the, the gentleman. However, until you can guarantee that, until you can make sure that that's not a hazardous material, you need to fully assess that situation and request the, the appropriate um, assistance. All right, number eight, which of the following situations most likely involves a hazardous material? Milk truck that's overturned is leaking fluid. Tractor trailer rig that's emitting a visible cloud. Moving van that collided head on with a small car. Or a pickup truck from the gas company that struck a tree. Which most likely involves hazardous material? The answer here for eight is B, the tractor trailer rig that's emitting a visible cloud. Anytime you see those visible clouds, typically uh, hazardous materials are involved. In our last one, number nine, uh, when dealing with a hazardous materials incident, where should you set up your decontamination area? Where should you set up the decontamination area? And again, this question probably not going to be very applicable to you as an EMT because unless you're trained, uh, you know, unless you have additional training in hazardous materials, if you're at the operations level or the, the uh, hazmat uh, technician level, probably not going to be setting up the decontamination area, but it's good information anyways. Um, where would you set that decontamination area up? And the answer there uh, for number nine is C. You're going to set up the decon area, the decontamination area, between the hazard zone and the treatment area. We would call that the warm zone, essentially. All right, and that's all for chapter 39. Thank you.